There is one statement I always think about uttered by legendary Nigerian writer Buchi Emecheta that was relevant to her life as it is still relevant in the modern day. She argued in this British interview that uh, in my culture, for instance, women are you know slight regarded slightly a little better than goats or something, but um, the most than goats, than goats and animals, you know, just slightly above that. It's she's a property to be owned by the man and um, your bride price is paid you are sort of bought now buchi was generally an upbeat human being but as you can see in this instance she wasn't trying to be funny nor was this an exaggeration she really meant that buchi was as this sophisticated british literature girl side i think you're the woman. gutsiest woman i've ever come across i think it's absolutely <laughs> extraordinary <laughs> Buti Emecheta believed a woman in Igbo society's eyes is only as good as the children she bears. You know, kind of like a domestic beast or something. And as a farmer myself, I definitely know what you do with animals that do not reproduce. And um, let's just say we don't do that to women because we really don't want to go to jail. <laughs> But there are still some very bad things society does to women who do not reproduce. I know it sounds so dirty when I say it like that, right? But it is what it is. As African women, we are raised to believe that um, having a husband and bearing children is our primary goal. So it becomes very difficult if you're not able to check these boxes. So with that, I welcome you to another Mimsy Special Edition as we explore one of the boldest writers in African history and a fascinating take on what it means to be or not to be a mother in African society. It's Bochi Emecheta on Baroness and Motherhood. Section A, the life of Bochi Emecheta. We always say that art is only a reflection of life and with Buchi Emecheta, her literal work was a close introspection of what she observed in the patriarchal Igbo society in the oppressive marriage. Her books The Slave Girl, The Bride Price, A Kind of Marriage, Second Class Citizen or The Joys of Motherhood really reflected that. They had strong autobiographical elements of course that revisited what she personally went through in her youth. Buchi Emecheta was born in Lagos, Nigeria on July 21, 1944. She was, as with other Nigerian Igbo girls, surrounded by traditional systems that really discriminated and marginalized them. French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte believed the only journey a girl should have is to the kitchen. And this is what Igbo tradition and most other different African traditions around the continent seem to believe as well. Girls like her were basically raised to become the hopeless, dependently submissive wife. The idea was that I should receive a little education to qualify me to be the wife of one of the new Nigerian elites. Mm. And the woman, you know, especially both women, supposed to be at home, docile, nice, and doing exactly what your husband told you to do. They were not allowed to go to school. They did most of the house chores and were expected to grow up to get married off and, of course, bear children eventually. This was, of course, the road which Emecheta followed as a young loyal servant of the system. Now, unlike many other feminist activists who develop resentment towards marriage or motherhood because they can't find a man in their lives. Buchi in her youth was beautiful, married and never had any problems with fertility. In 1960 she was married at the tender age of 16 where she was already pregnant and had four more children later on. By age 22 she had given birth to five children in just a space of six years. But it was the surrounding circumstances that her babies were brought in that really threw her off. Her husband, called Sylvester, became so loving that he would often remind her that the only reason she migrated to UK to be with him was because she was world class at washing nappies. Woo! She did all the work but was really appreciated by her toxic husband. The most painfully defining moment where she realized just how much of a piece of work and an anchor her husband was really 
was when he burnt a manuscript of a novel she was really working hard on which was so much of a painful event to Bucci, she often compared it to the murder of her own baby. Realized that um, that marriage was not going to last mm. because, as I said in the book, I said it meant like uh, like burning my child, mm. and anybody who who did that, you know, I'll never forgive the person. And to Sylvester, he probably thought that this would be the crushing final blow to her ambitions, crushing her self-esteem permanently. But as he would discover, Bucci was totally hardcore and when push came to shove she would totally shove back this was probably the moment she decided to rebel against tradition by leaving her husband taking the children and channeling her painful frustrations into more of her literal work without my father to look after me I had to look after myself because of the things she went through in this real life marriage, the things of patriarchy, sexism, domestic abuse, oppression, female reproduction, gender politics and barrenness were prolific in her work throughout her lifetime. Her iconic lead characters, New Ego from Joys of Motherhood and Ada Ophidi from Second Class Citizen are direct derivations of her and what she went through. Both these classic characters get to go head to head with the patriarchal system that looked at women as only baby making machines and the consequences of such treatment. Section B, the stakes of barrenness. Today, the cultural stigmatization against women who do not have a child in marriage or in general not to sugarcoat anything here is still as bad as it was in the past. Maybe slightly less harsher and more discreet, but yeah, it's still bad. And a lot of feelings get really hurt in the midst of all this madness. There are quite a number of scenarios. I've met so many women who ask me, why are you not pregnant yet? And like you said, the, the pressure is usually on the women. Yes, that's true. And then later I get to discover these are women who have had the same experiences. Seriously? Yes. Is that possible? Yes. yes. You would do that to another woman? Would yes. You do that to somebody? I, yes. In Petina Gapa's in Elegy for Easterly, the Shona word manje o manje is originally a word that was made to refer to an animal that does not reproduce but not before too long someone found it to be appropriate to use that word as a fancy demeaning label for a married woman who is yet to give birth yet <laughs> and you know the funny thing is it is women who use this demeaning label the most to refer to each other and like what she said in that interview, this is no exaggeration. In African society, women culturally are expected to assume the role of motherhood when they reach a certain age, especially when they get married, because this is supposed to be the pinnacle of womanhood in most African cultures. Most cultures, there is what we call the bride price. And the ceremony of which this happens varies from culture to culture or language to language, obviously, but the concept is still generally the same. For example, in Shona culture, we call it Rora. In Debele or Zulu culture, they call it Lobola. And in Igbo culture, they call it Ime Ego. The cultural bride price is not a ring, but a cultural payment that the groom puts down to marry his wife in form of cattle, groceries, clothes, and of course, money. So in a way, Bucci is kind of right when she says that the wife is sort of bored. She's a property to be owned by the man and um, your bride price is paid, you are sort of bought. During these ceremonies, some elders even pass statements like, she's a virgin and she will bear you many children for your family. I know these statements make the elders sound like farmers as I said before discussing livestock value but again that's the point. Like regard a slightly a little better than goods or something. And when you buy something what does it become? She's a property to be owned. Yes it becomes the word that you fear it becomes your property. Even an investment is delicately put by Phineas from the film Neria. Look, man, she's your wife, our wife. Yes. This paddock here helped pay for her. 
all this has controversially made the very traditional means we used to marry come under fire with many gender activists. They believe these traditional ceremonies should be abolished because they begin the process of, of objectifying women as nothing more than a business investment, an investment that should make its returns by bearing children. And the firstborn is seen as a final mandatory symbolic piece that ties the two foreign families into one. Here in Zimbabwe, if a woman goes past two years and even just a year in some instances, it is almost inevitable that nasty gossip about her fertility will start doing its rounds. As they did when new ego in joys of motherhood couldn't give the first husband she was married to a bouncing baby boy. In reality, it even doesn't matter if the parents can take care of those newborn children or not. It's cultural. There are those poor countries like Niger where the fertility rate is almost 7.0 but children retain their importance anyway despite that the fact that they may live in a small sewer infested cabin, the children should be just there. And if it's a son as demonstrated again in Bucci's books, that's a huge bonus. The existence is there to tie down the union like no other traditional way can. A wife must assume her identity in the family by giving her husband and in-laws a child. Otherwise, she is just some woman who is eating their son's food whom they have the right to replace at any given moment. Because everyone knows that it's a scientifically proven fact that it's impossible for a man to be sterile. Yes, as brutal of a reality as this may sound, to keep it short and sweet in most African households, it's not really a marriage until a child is born into the family. So, you see, having babies is no child's play. Get it? So in the cultural eyes, the more children you have, the more happier and more fulfilling your life should be, right? Right? Section C, the African joys of motherhood. The joys of motherhood portrays the pressure women have to face to give birth as not only malicious but not really worth it at the end of the day because the household conflicts remain ripe before and after they do have children, especially in polygamous marriages, where sometimes more wives are taken as a means to solve a problem of fertility. These type of marriages tend to produce more children on average, of course, because there are now more wives. But besides that, in a marriage setting where women desperately fight to be the favorite wife, the quote favorite wife, the pressure to have children is much higher because these children are commonly used as a means of gain the husband's shared love over the other wives and many women today as we speak live in this kind of combatic environment where babies are used as weapons for marital validation in marange a sub-christian religion in zimbabwe where polygamy is common girls get married off at even 11 years and start giving birth at even the same age some women have given birth to up to 19 children. Uh, for the past 19 years, Vavar ku kunonzi che kunonzi kuberi kere kana kuzara kuberi kavana. Vavar kuberi kavana. Amai na umeva kuberi kavana 19, and she is 43 years ikoshino. They consciously compete by the number of children they give birth to. This is seen in Joys of Motherhood again when New Ego, who is easily hijacked and humiliated by the younger wives because she is yet to give birth, unlike them. Buchi Emecheta, like most other feminists, hated the fact that a woman can only truly claim her own womanhood by being a mother, which made other more radical feminists like Alice Walker reject the entire concept of motherhood, heterosexuality, <laughs> or even family altogether. I mean, this woman disowned her only daughter Rebecca over a letter because she discovered she was about to have a baby. The novels Joys of Motherhood, Second Class Citizen, The Slave Girl is an all-out attack on this fake utopian idea of a fruitful traditional marriage because even even after all that conflict and child dropping, does a sister get her respect? Of course not. <laughs> a 
as written in Joys of Motherhood, way back then to their room, it occurred to New Ego that she was a prisoner, imprisoned by her love for her children, imprisoned by her role as the senior wife. And furthermore, writes, a woman's joy is only in the name. She worries over them, looks after them when they are small, but in the actual help on the farm, the upholding of the family name all belong to the father. Joys of Motherhood. The book is ironically named that to highlight this irony. When you really look at it in Joys of Motherhood, the more children New Ego has, the more pain and suffering she has until her tragic death. I mean, the sister never gets a break, whether it's the raging poverty, hunger, depression, infant mortality, lack of appreciation from her husband who gets to take more wives without her approval and her marital conflicts when those wives come in and come by and start shooting babies of their own, you could say her happiest moment is when she was dead. While Ida in second class city's son shoots babies too, pays all the bills and is the main cash cow but is still treated like she is the freeloader who can only quote. How he put it was, or did you come to England to be a lady just washing nappies? <laughs> washing nappies very good at washing nappies in conclusion the message here is not you should hate your children and dump them in a trash can like lucius line from empire remember that but however they shouldn't be where a woman's life starts and where it ends like they think so in many other cultures around the world like marangi <laughs> There is more to life, you know. Although once upon a time Buchi Emicheta was indeed conditioned to think that she was only as good as the children she bore, she had believed it. But when they hammered her hard enough, she didn't collapse, but she came back swinging. She first liberated herself through her education and more importantly, her writing. Her writing became her escape out of this mental bondage that had been culturally imposed on her. When she recovered her self-esteem, that's when she realized she could liberate others as well. Despite all she went through and her high regard for Western education as liberating, Butchi still loved and respected her Igbo culture greatly. It's nice, isn't it? It is very nice. It but, yes. Yes. She loved being a mother too and never really blamed her children for anything in her books. They were just victims of circumstances to her. As she once said, I am a woman, a woman of Africa. I am a daughter of Nigeria. And if she is in shame, I shall stay and mourn with her in shame. She often refused to be called a feminist as she preferred to be called a quote womanist who only tried to liberate other women from this mental bondage by showing her readers the dangers of letting others impose their own values and standards on you just because of your gender. It is perhaps this love for her native sisters that made her tell these cautionary tales from her own life. A treatment like this can and has killed the self-worth of many barren or childless women around the world too. But what Butch's life and philosophy taught us is that as a woman, you can get married, have children and have a man in your life, but only if it truly serves you. As again, there is still more to life than that. You are a person beyond the child. Wow. You are a person first beyond that child. Yes. There is something you are created to do. You have a purpose. That is why I talk about it, because I feel like we're losing so many great leaders. We're losing so many great people out yeah. there because I'm so focused on this one thing yeah. that I cannot focus on any other thing. A woman should be given the space to define her own roles and dreams and when she does be respected for it too. Even if she doesn't have children, it may be a long time before society gets the memo, but her books are a great place to start. They are pretty awesome if you ask me, and I highly recommend them for deeper detail. So, as always guys, thanks for watching Mimsy Africa, and don't forget to subscribe for more videos like this if you like what you see. And as always, thanks for watching Mimsy Africa. Africa. See you next time.
hi guys thanks for watching the video and as always i hope you got enlightened you know here at mimsy africa we also offer graphic designing and video editing services to anyone around the world the world remit the prices are quite reasonable of course so if you have a youtube channel video blog or social media business that may require quality visuals that really make a statement and really engage your audience hit us up either here in the comment section or at our instagram inbox and we can make arrangements there the link is in the bio and as always folks thanks for watching bmc africa